I am uh, really happy to be here. Uh, this is a great opportunity to talk to you guys, and we're a pretty small crowd, so feel free to indicate before the presentation is over if uh, you have any questions or you want me to, to dive deeper in on anything. Um, for the last few years, I've been working on computer vision, and specifically where computer vision intersects big data and the industrial internet. And, um, you know, one thing I do want to make clear is a little bit of a distinction between um, what computer vision does versus what is traditionally called machine vision. Machine vision is a term that's used in the manufacturing industry, and it's very specifically the application of computer vision to understand what's going on in a physical space. So, you know, analyzing pictures of dogs and cats from Google search results isn't really machine vision. Uh, looking, you know, counting the teeth of a gear, measuring how far they uh, deviate from spec, that's more machine vision. And uh, what happened was uh, I had done machine vision uh, when I was in college, before Slashdot, before the web, uh, and it has a, uh, it was pretty much in its infancy at the time, it was the early 90s. Since then it's evolved somewhat, but really what's happened is the machine vision providers, the people who create appliances that, you know, you, someone buys it to take a look and make sure that the, the caps on the aspirin bottle, um, they grew up in a completely separate ecosystem from the connected devices that we have in our pockets and the servers they talk to and all of the internet sort of kung fu that's gone on in the past 15 years. Um, they have really focused on uh, increasing what I would call the specs of a vision sensor. So more megapixels, faster frames per second, and uh, you know, an algorithm that runs uh, at fast, a particular algorithm that runs faster. Um, what I noticed uh, when I went into plants that had sometimes hundreds, uh, you know, 400, 500 cameras in it, is that you know, for all of the gigabytes of data these things process, uh, you know, every production cycle, um, usually what's coming out of them is a single bit, often in terms of a wire that goes hot or cold, um, that just says pass or fail. And so, uh, one of the things that I decided what to do was, you know, see if there would be some way to use machine vision to make a comprehensive picture of what happens in every stage of production in the manufacturing process. And if you think about the types of big data problems that we're doing really well on solving, uh, things like aggregating server data, uh, things like aggregating uh, data from different databases, there's certain data acquisition costs. Um, in this case, you know, there are certainly data acquisition costs to setting up cameras and dialing in vision algorithm, algorithms and this kind of thing, but nobody has really yet knit together all of the data that comes out of a factory. All of the picture data, all of the sensor data, all of the machine data, so that you can query, you know, what has gone on in your factory in the same way that, uh, you know, you can query what's going on in your servers. And so, you know, I set about this, uh, this goal, and really what we're talking about is a, a data path very similar to MapReduce. Um, you want to turn raw pictures from the factory floor, uh, you want to do some processing on them, but at the end of the day what you really need, and this is where uh, I did most of my uh, sort of contextual inquiry focus, is data that the people who are controlling that process can use and even at a higher level, the operating efficiency and how you know much a plant or how well a plant or multiple plants are functioning together. So we designed uh, a solution we call it Site Machine, and really what it does is uh, you know what kind of exactly what you would expect: uh, cameras on a plant floor, some local processing and storage. Um, but then the really interesting stuff happens after the spot inspection is made, after that pass-fail call is, is made. Now you can push that up online, uh, you know, using web services. You can uh, process it uh, for much more interesting problems and trends using uh, scalable cloud computing, and then distribute that data wherever you need it. And you know, we are really witness to a great 
convergence. I mean, the cost of camera sensors uh, has fallen rapidly. I, you know, even when I was doing it in the 90s, you know, any sort of camera, even black and white ones, were you know several thousand dollars. Uh, now they cost eight bucks, and they're uh, you know much much higher resolution, much better color definition. Um, the uh, ability to have on-demand computing power makes a lot of solving a lot of these problems possible. Uh, because to look at a year's worth of visual data, uh, if you were doing it serially or even with a you know a few computers, would take a long time. Now you can spin up a hundred computers, solve your problems, spin them right back down. Uh, the cost of storing massive amounts of data is almost negligible. And the, I think really the key feature, though, the thing why this didn't happen five or even or, or ten years ago, is that the open source infrastructure, the you know, linear algebra libraries that you need to do a lot of computer vision. The uh, libraries like OpenCV, uh, library or libraries and uh, platforms like Hadoop, um, that hasn't been really robust and, and graspable until recently. So it's hard for an organization of any size because they had, uh, you know, a lot of things that they had to build uh, before solving this type of problem would be possible. And. The reason why this matters, I mean, uh, you talk about manufacturing quality and a lot of people kind of shrug and so what, okay, you know, uh, someone's, uh, you know, uh, ignition key maybe uh, didn't get in the right place and that cost GM $12 billion, well, what does that really mean? Um, in, in a very real sense, manufacturing quality constrains what we can invent. Um, and if you look at a lot of our global problems, uh, things like renewable energy have a very, very deeply rooted manufacturing component. If you want to make denser batteries, if you want to make cheaper solar cells, uh, all of these things, uh, you know, require that you be, are able to fabricate things at a certain quality. And when you look at very sort of aspirational human race types of things, like mining asteroids or doing manned missions to other planets, it, you know, if you're going to build something that's the size of the Starship Enterprise and has the precision of a Swiss watch, you need this technology first because you need to know everything that's going on, not just in the assembly process, but in the fabrication of all of the component pieces. And so this is just kind of a visual example. Uh, these are uh, customers who use our platform. Um, this is uh, the very, very beginning of the supply chain. This is a tier two that anneals steel. So they get wire and their job are to break these microscopic masses of carbon. Uh, into the right, correct dispersion so that the steel is soft enough that uh, when it's formed by the tool, the die doesn't break immediately, but it's still hard enough uh, to keep your tire on uh, while you're driving uh, down the road. Now you go to the bolt manufacturer, and the bolt manufacturer has a different set of constraints. They're going to pound this into something that they, you know, ship to a car, uh, car uh, OEM, and uh, surprisingly, and uh, I learned uh, so this this was our first customer, and I learned so much about fastener part geometry, uh, way more than I ever thought I would have. Um, you have uh, certain uh, parts of a fastener which don't matter hardly at all, and then you have certain parts that have to be accurate within 20 microns. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to uh, it, it's not going to be able to uh, you know pair effectively with its bearing surface. And so, uh, you know, we worked with this fastener company and developed a solution that now basically uh, is tracking all of their dimensions of all of their parts throughout their production process. Now you're going to take this and mate it with the tire and put it on a car. And, uh, you know, that's yet another kind of phase. Uh, the, the person who's at this stage doesn't really care what's happening to the steel but he definitely cares about the parts that he's getting and whether or not when he torques them in, uh, the head's gonna pop off. And finally, you have the final inspection assembly where all of these things come together and you're inspecting lots and lots of different parts. And the, you know, the idea is uh, the faster you can get that data, uh, the more automatic you can find root cause problems uh, by you know, doing anomaly detection, and even by doing what I would consider some of the very, very simplistic statistics, which are common in quality, um, the more useful and available you can make that data, the more sophisticated things you can make. And, and the reason why is, is that when, you know, 
right now when you want to refine a process, when engineers design a, 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 a production line, they have to make a lot of guesses about what's going to go on. And certain discrepancies are going to arise in this uh, system. And these discrepancies are going to kind of pile up and interfere with each other. And right now the way that they fix that is they run the line a little bit, see what defects come out, run the line a little bit, see what defects come out, do root cause analysis on those problems. And in very, very complicated lines, that takes a very, very long time. And we're now at the point where uh, this can potentially happen where you're seeing defects even really before they happen based on machine timings, based on uh, the parts that are coming in as they get assembled. And so the root cause analysis can be much faster. You can, uh, you know, calibrate a production line much quicker. And, uh, you know, that's going to have a, a very, very substantial, con uh, release a very, very substantial constraint on both the sophistication that uh, of the things that you can make and how well you can make things. Um, you know, this is just to kind of uh, show, this is generally the kind of data that our customers want to look at, look at. And this is a very, very common statistical tool that was developed by uh, Ed Deming um, called the control chart. And the control chart just plots a measurement over time and it uses a set of heuristics called Nelson's Rules uh, to determine whether things are in and out of control. And Nelson's Rules, for someone who is a sophisticated data scientist, uh, would sound really, really trivial. Like, uh, you know, do you have, uh, you know, five points in a row that are trending in a single direction? Uh, do you have six points that oscillate above and below the mean? Um, they really were rules of thumb because they were developed in an era before statistical processing. And so, while there are software packages now that can do that, uh, you know, this is still kind of the, the uh, kind of the biblical tool of how you uh, achieve quality in measurement. Um, but then at this higher level, uh, you know, uh, people who are in charge of a whole factory, a plant manager, what they really want is operational data like uptime. Uh, you know, OEE is, is kind of this common statistic which you can think of it a little bit like uh, GDP for a factory. So, you know, amount of time online, uh, you know, amount of uh, output, uh, amount of quality, uh, you know, if your quality is not high, um, these get basically combined together. And so being able to go from this very, very deep to a very, very high uh, view of how a machine or how a, a factory can work as a single machine uh, is really what our mission was in terms of uh, determining the data use. Um, one thing I would do want to talk about since we're, you know, in the images data lab is how while we were started solving lots of problems and we realized that one of our, our severe constraints to being able to scale this process was going to be how to do uh, image processing uh, quicker and more efficiently, um, we've kind of developed a, new, a technique which I've started calling quantitative vision. And it really is uh, a pretty novel idea, idea but very, very powerful. Um, in classical computer science, when you want to solve a vision problem, uh, you handcraft this algorithm that looks at a bunch of pixels and extracts from it, you know, kind of the perfect feature. So like, you know, uh, find a certain thing and then, uh, you know, identify it, uh, make sure that you've got it kind of segmented properly. Um, what we've started doing is taking a different approach uh, called quantitative vision, where we extract a lot of features uh, and so we may do a lot of features uh, in aggregate. So you do blobs, you do uh, corners, you do edges. Um, now, instead of looking at your bitmap for this, uh, for what you're looking at, you start mining your features uh, for this data. And because you've gone from this relatively unstructured data of a bitmap uh, to now something which is a much more structured data set, uh, of features with their locations, their color, their uh, proximity to each other. Um, you have a lot more uh, usable tools in kind of the data science world, uh, things like machine learning uh, that you can use to, uh, to do it. And uh, you, know, you have a lot more computing power than you do on what is the traditional computer vision platform, which would be a machine vision uh, sensor chip. Um, 
the last part, and you know, this is kind of obvious to us, but most of the practitioners of machine vision really don't do this, is that you have to compare that signal to known data so that as you're making changes, you're regressing. Um, you know, for someone who has been doing test-driven development in software, uh, this sounds uh, very, very logical and normal, and of course, oh, you do it that way. Um, realistically, most practitioners of machine vision in the field uh, tune it so that it works right, they sit and they watch it, and if the next 10 things work, uh, yeah, it's working okay. Um, this gets you to much, much higher accuracy rates. Um, and that's one of the things which has made, uh, I, I think is kind of made us a differentiating offer, off, offerer of just kind of pure machine vision uh, is that we're able to hit those 99.9% .9 accuracy rates just by kind of checking our work. Um, the framework that we developed uh, to kind of speed up our image process, um, it is uh, intended to work with a wide variety of devices and offers an abstraction layer for, uh, you know, if you want to work with cameras or connects or uh, cell phone optics or uh, all sorts of different things. Um, and uh, it's got a very vibrant and uh, somewhat aggravated, because we haven't updated the release in, in a while, uh, open source community. Um, that is uh, very, very helpful for people who want to solve problems. So, uh, you know, we have a, an online forum. People, you know, talk about what they're uh, building, what they want to be able to do. And we actually feel like, you know, uh, the historical retrospective uh, symbol CV may be one of the big things that we've contributed to the Internet of Things. Um, so that's my presentation. Uh, I'd love it if you guys have any questions. Uh, I'm uh, at Nate Ostendorp on Twitter and Nate at SightMachine.com on email. Thank you. Thank you.